sad. We're talking about death. Death. There's not a person in this room that does not have to contend with death. Everyone here will have to, at some point in your life, and some of you I know are not there yet, have to deal with the idea that you will someday die. And we deal with death in different ways. Some of us try to, to, we fear it. Yeah, you know, fear death. It's a scary event, and death is kind of scary, up into the great unknown. Of course, it's not unknown to us. But we say that, it's unknown. And it is scary, you know, because we, 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 we know our physical bodies. We know what this looks like right now. We know what our life is now. Even with all your aches and pains, you know it. And so it's hard Sometimes, some people, we, sometimes we fear it. Sometimes we try to ignore death, right? If I don't look at it, it ain't real. Now, we're dealing with COVID right now. We're seeing lots of people dying. That's supposedly the reason why they're closing us all down. It's because so many people dying. So it's hard to ignore, but yet we're managing to do it. We're managing to ignore it fairly well. We can try to hide from death. You can try to cheat death. Of course, if you have enough money, you might be able to pull it off. For a little while, anyways. For the rest of us, I'm sorry. There ain't much we can do about that. We can, we can try to outrun death. Of course, from the look of my belly and some of your bellies, maybe a few of us should try to outrun a little more death. Uh, just saying. <laughs> but we all face death in, in different ways. We all face death and, and we have to deal with it. We have to confront that the fact that this life will end. You will die. And Jesus today, he, he, he deals with death. Now, as we read some of this passage, and we're going to go all the way through the book of chapter 11, so I'm going to let you guys stay seated, and we're going to just read portions at a time, because it's long. We're going to deal with a man named Lazarus, who's, who's the friend of Jesus, and Jesus, and, and Jesus, the author of this, is looking back at both Lazarus and Jesus, so some of this is written with the idea of Jesus in mind, but Jesus is going to have to come and deal with his friend's death, and this will be, this, this event will be one of the last public ministry events of Jesus' life. See, up until this point, he's been like, you know, showing off with, you know, healing people and He's been, you know, uh, feeding 5,000, 7,000, and he's been, he's been taking care of things. People have been flocking to him and following him. This will be, and we call that the public ministry section of Jesus' life. Well, at this point, we're going to see less and less public ministry. At this point, from here on out, the cross is imminent. It's coming. Jesus knows it. His disciples know it. Everyone who hangs around with Jesus knows it. Even when this passage, we're going to see they're afraid of it even now. The cross is coming. But we're going to deal with death today and the death of his friend Lazarus. Before we go any further, I want to stop and let's pray. Father God, I praise you today, Lord. I thank you for your wonderful blessings. I thank you for the gift that you have given us, that you have able to uh, just lift us up. I pray that you um, just focus on me, Lord, that you will help us to hear what we need to hear right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why don't you see if the door is unlocked, if I need in. Sorry, there's a... All right, 
Lazarus, Lazarus, we've got to say it in Texan accent, Lazarus, Lazarus. Um, now, we've already seen Mary and Martha, right? We had that sermon. Mary and Martha, friends of Jesus, they have a brother named Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is very close to Jesus. He's not one of the disciples, though. And we don't know if he just didn't want to be a disciple, he was too young to be a disciple, he uh, didn't make the cut to be a disciple, we don't know. But Lazarus is one of the friends, the few friends that Jesus has. Jesus, when you look at his life, he hangs out with his disciples and Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That's pretty much it. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of friends. And it says, it will say that Lazarus is a man that Jesus loved. Now, before we read, I got to stop right there. You do know that we can have love without sex being involved. I got to say that. I think our society has forgotten that. You can love someone without having a homosexual relationship or a heterosexual. You can love someone without sex being involved in the situation. When it says that Jesus loved Lazarus, there is not a homosexual relationship going on between the two. Though you can read plenty of books that will say so. Because they forget that you don't have to have sex involved with love. So let's go ahead and read. I'm going to let you stay seated for this passage. We're going to go ahead and read um, 1 through 17-ish. All right. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one who lo you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. That, that's how you show love, you just say put, right? Then after that, he said to the disciples, go to Judea again. Let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he, does, he doesn't stumble because the light is not in him. Then he said, this And they told him, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm only on my way to wake him up. Yeah. Then the disciples said, hey, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will get, better, get well. Yeah. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking of natural sleep. So Jesus said, told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I was, wasn't there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go too, so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, they found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Mm. This, is, this is one of those passages. So Jesus is out teaching, out in his public ministry, doing his thing. And a runner comes and finds him. They don't have a mail system. They can't call him on the telephone. They don't have Skype. You've got to have a runner. So a runner comes and finds Lazarus and finds Jesus. Tells him, Lazarus is dying. Now, some simple math here. It takes probably about a day for the runner to find Jesus. That means it's going to take about a day for Jesus to get back to Bethany. 
and he sits down, sits and waits for two days. So that means Lazarus, who's been in the, according to verse 17, we know that Lazarus has been in the dead for four days. So that means the runner left, and Lazarus died just about right after the runner left. Imagine the guilt of that runner, right? Man, if I'd just been faster finding Jesus. Jesus hadn't sat for two days. Now, did Jesus know that Lazarus was dying? Probably. In the Bible, we see that Jesus is fully God. He's fully human. And he did give up some of his knowledge when he became fully human. He willfully gave it up. But we read the scriptures and other places in the scriptures, it seems like Jesus knew this kind of stuff was going on. And so he probably knew that Lazarus was dying. But he didn't rush to Lazarus. That's what we would have done, right? You know someone's dying, and you're, I'm going to be by your side. Jesus is out preaching and healing and teaching. and He doesn't rush there. In fact, when he, he hears about it, he sits for two more days. Now, when we hear that Jesus let Lazarus die, because we've seen in other places, your faith will be here, and she's sick, and she's sick, and she's not, nah, she's just sleeping, get up. He doesn't have to be there. We hear that death happened, and we, we see that death happened, and, 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 and it, for us, that makes, well, that was horrible of Jesus. That was horrible. Why did he let him die? Because we often fight against death. We, we don't like the idea of death. We think death is the enemy. But if we read our scriptures, we know that death is not the enemy. Death is actually a gift. See, Jesus, when, when God made the world, he made it good. He looked at, he created man, and he called it tov ma'od, which means very good. And he offered Adam and Eve, you read your scriptures, he offered them a choice, right? You can eat of this, I don't know, magic fruit. I don't know what it was, this, this fruit. And live forever. And then there was another fruit, right? There's two trees. Another fruit, it says, don't eat of that one because you're not ready for it yet. Don't eat of that one. It's the one on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve, they're offered with a choice, right? The choice. Do I, I follow God's plan? Do I follow God's glory? Do I follow his way? Or do I follow this other plan, this other way, where he says you'll be like God, which is interesting because they were already like God in his image. But they thought they wanted to be more like God, I guess, like the gods. And they have a choice. And, of course, we know, you read your scriptures, that they chose to eat of the fruit, and then they are corrupt, they are fallen, and God, who, according to the original design, death was never part of that original design. They were supposed to be eating of the tree of life. And they had to... And so he brings death, and it is not good for them to live in this state, this corrupt state, he says. And so he brings death in. He brings death in as a gift how many of you look at death as a gift? It's hard, right? It's hard to look at death as a gift. I mean, we're not talking suicide here. We're not talking that kind of gift, because that just transfers your pain to someone else. That's not what we're talking about. But death is a gift. And Jesus allows Lazarus to die. I mean, but we often say, well, if I was God, right? 
If I was God, there'd be no suffering. If God's a good God, then why does suffering exist? I hear that a lot. But that was the choice we made. And each time we are offered, we're offered choices throughout our day, right? You are offered a choice every day, multiple times a day, whether you're going to follow the highway to heaven, what are you songs? The stairway to heaven or the highway to hell. All right. You can either path, follow the path that go at least to heaven, leads to the, 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 the oneness with God, where you are ruling with him. He says you'll be, uh, we are meant to be kings and queens of his creation. That intermediate, when we think of heaven and, and hell, we often think of that intermediate space after you die. But the Bible has very little to say on that subject. Most of the time when it talks about heaven and hell, it's talking about the new heaven and the new he- uh, earth that is after the resurrected state. Um, and uh, because the intermediate state, that intermediate state never was part of the original design. That was a gift. And um, Jesus let us make that choice, and God let us make that choice. So death is part of the plan, part of our life. He's part of our life. And Jesus came to give us eternal life. But Bethany, where Lazarus is, is about a mile and a half from Jerusalem. Okay? So he's got to go to Bethany for the funeral. He says, let's go to the funeral. It's about a mile and a half from Jerusalem. Now, the people of Jerusalem, the leaders in Jerusalem, it says the Jews in the book of John. That means the Sanhedrin, the leaders. They're trying to kill Jesus because of multiple reasons. Um, They fear... um, his religious upbringing, right? But also they fear the Romans. Um, the funeral at that time, he, Jesus can't just sneak into Bethany. You think uh, rumors fall fast here? We have TV to distract us. Funerals at that time are very public, very public events. If you have a funeral today, you might, you know, well, only if people know you and know what is going on, and you might put it in the paper, and people might know about it. It's a very public event at that, that time. Formal at the time you died, you were buried that day because you're in the Jewish world. You're not allowed to be embalmed. That's not, not how that works. You couldn't be burnt. You had to be buried, so you would start to stink. But formal mourning lasted seven days. Seven days from the. You were buried, and then you started mourning, and women would gather and weep and wail. And if you had money to show off how wealthy you were, you could even hire professional weepers, weepers and wailers. So how many of you got your weepers and wailers all right and lined up for your funeral? All right. Now, we do know Lazarus is fairly wealthy, so they may have had some professionals. That was a thing back there. And so when Jesus decides to go, he's taking his life at risk. He's taking the disciples' life at risk. He's saying, we're going to go. We're only a mile and a half from where the people are that want to kill us. And it ain't going to be quiet. People are going to know that Jesus is showing up. You know, he's claimed, Jesus has been going around claiming to be God, and that's going to get the religious people all fired up. You know, even Paul might have been one of these people. We don't know that, but Paul may have been one of these people. But on top of that, when he's getting people riled up, the Romans, who ruled over Israel at the time, they have what's called the Pax Romana. You can pretty much do whatever you want as long as you don't break the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And part of breaking the Roman peace would be starting a new religion. Well, if you're not Jewish, which they were trying to be just reform the Jewish 
world, but people were already starting to break from the Jewish. They were, starting to, they were afraid that the, the Romans would come down and accuse them of breaking the Pax Romana and come and wipe them out, which they will, will happen to the Israelites in A.D. 70. Jerusalem will be destroyed along with the temple. That's when the second uh, temple period ends. Um, but they're afraid of this. And so when Thomas states, let's go die too, he's not saying let's go commit suicide. He's saying we have a choice. We can either let Jesus go by himself, and he's probably going to die because everyone's going to be there. No. Or we can go with him and die too. He's not saying let's go commit suicide. He's just saying we're not going to go die with Lazarus. He's saying, hey, very realistic. We might go die too. Now, this is a choice he has to make. I think it's interesting because, you know, the writers of this, the writer of John, wrote this after Jesus' death. So they already knew what happened at Jesus when they wrote this. It's interesting that as Thomas says, let's go die too, we already know at the end of the story, the disciples weren't there. They didn't go die too. But here Thomas is making these bold claims, let's go die too. And um, so Jesus waits two more days for the glory of God. Uh, this goes back to a well-known Jewish belief that the soul of a dead person remained in the vicinity of the body, hoping to re-enter it for three days. So once decomp, uh, decomp starts in, that's when the soul, according to the Jewish, early Jewish faith, uh, was that it left. So in their understanding, remember, they didn't have the same kind of science, technology, understanding we do now. So he had to wait four days. Make sure the soul was fully gone. Decomp was there. Lazarus is really dead. You know, because Jesus waiting doesn't necessarily make this true, but it makes it true for them. They were, that was their understanding of the world. And Jesus, isn't it amazing how God deals with us in our understanding? I'm so grateful that he became man so that he could deal with us in our understanding. Because he sees so much more of the universe than we could ever understand. And so, Jesus goes, and when he arrives, both Mary and Martha will express deep devotion in, in their friendship, Jesus. But they say, if Jesus, if Lazarus was, if Jesus, you were here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Now, that's kind of a, a major Statement of belief, right? Twenty one through twenty seven. So Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will grant you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, Martha is already thinking about that resurrection time, you know, the end of the age. A lot of you are thinking about that too. You know, when, when you start getting older, I find the more time we think about the end of days. And... Uh, She's thinking about that. She's, well, I'm going to have to wait till that resurrection happens at the end when the dead will rise. Same kind of hope a lot of you have. We've got to wait. I got to wait. But Jesus is thinking a little different. Jesus needs to prove something. And so Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forever. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed in you. You are the Christ, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Verse 
Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was in a cave and a stone and was lying against it. You know, before all this happens, before he raises Lazarus, and we know he's going to raise Lazarus, you know the story, right? I like how he takes time to mourn. Verse 35 is the, the shortest chapter in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. Even though Jesus knows what he's about to do. We're about to read Jesus calling Lazarus out. He knows what he's going about going to do. He still takes time to mourn. Mourning is part of being human, is about or being in this fallen world, is we have to deal with the consequence that, yes, we, sin is in there. We're in a fallen bodies. We're in fallen earth. Death is a gift, but it still means we're going to have consequences. We're going to mourn for it. It's part of our life. We're going to have to mourn. Even Jesus, who knows, mourns, and he weeps. As Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Yes, you're supposed to automatically be thinking about what happens later on in the book. We're supposed to be thinking some things about Jesus here. The cave, the stone... Not only was this normal burial practice, they were also wealthy, got a cave with a stone on it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. And Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead for four days. That's nasty. Jesus, I'm not, I'm not feeling you on this one. I trust you, but Vix hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And that's why he does this. We have to remember that he's not doing this because he, you know, favors Lazarus above all else. He's not doing this to show off. He's doing it for the glory of God. He said, so they removed the stone, and then Jesus raised his eyes, and he said, and he didn't have to say this because he and God are already talking, but he wants the people around him to know what's going on. He says, uh, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me because of the crowd standing here. I said this so that they may believe you sent me. After this, he said, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen stripes and with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what, they, what he did believed in him. Oops, wrong button. Now, Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave for God's glory. It wasn't because he wanted Lazarus never to die. Or because Lazarus, he, didn't want, he wanted Jesus to go first before Lazarus. Lazarus is going to have to go. I've always felt sorry for Lazarus. He got to do this again. Oh, I died once. You mean I got to die again? I had a, a, a friend of mine in college die of, um, of malaria. And uh, people, she was a very popular young lady, and people gathered around her grave and, re and prayed that God raised her from the grave. And, and, and we had to go out there and say, why are you wanting her raised from the grave? Well, God's glory, you, we miss her. She's such a wonderful woman. She's not time to die yet. She's dead. Leave her at peace. Jesus died on the cross to raise 
from the dead. But God here is making a point. He's saying, and it goes back to that passage we saw where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Who believes in me will live even though he dies. Who believes in me will never die. See, they needed to see something physical. As the whole Bible, a lot of the Bible is about this. Something physical has to happen so we can understand the spiritual. Israelites had to be physically separate so we could understand the spiritual that we need to be separate. Physical resurrection needed to happen so they could understand, hey, you're going to be raised from the dead even though you die. Eternal life. Jesus proves that death has no hold for God. Death is not the end. Death does not end life. It just is a transition. That when we believe, we live. And I love that we live on. Death has no hold over us. But here's something we often misunderstand as we think about Death, and we think, well, when I die, then I go to heaven. That's when eternal life starts. That's not how the Bible reads. The Bible tells us that eternal life starts when you accept Jesus Christ. Not later on. Not at, well, when I die, then I have eternal life. No, it's now. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have eternal life now, and you need to be living your life according to the idea that you have eternal life now. It means you have to be walking the path of Jesus. Because we have that choice to make, right? In the same, on the flip side, it's not just when you die, you might go to hell. You are walking the path, the highway to hell now. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you are choosing to walk away from Him, if you're choosing to follow the path that does not lead to God's glory, then you are walking the path that leads to separation from God now. And that's how he describes hell. It's about separation from God. And he uses all kinds of language like fire and a trash heap and war and darkness. And to describe separation from God. But it's about separation from the eternal. And so... God says that this is now, eternal life is now, so we, we must walk daily our path. And if you have accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, yes, you may slip off the road. There's, I'm not saying that we're sinners in the hands of an angry God. That's bad theology. Fun sermon if you want to look it up, but bad theology. God has saved us by His power. His glory, if you've accepted Him. And because He has saved us, we walk the path of His righteousness. We seek eternal life now because death has no hold over us. Death is but a transitional state of life. And because we believe that, you live differently. If you really believe that, you live differently. Oh, it's not going to mean you're going to live freely and like just, you know, YOLO. If you don't know what that means, ask a kid. Um, We live differently. Things, we don't fear death. We don't fear to tell people about the kingdom of God. 
Because the only thing they can do is take away your life. This physical one. Which is going to end anyways. That's how people, that's why Paul went until he was martyred. Peter went until he was martyred. Jesus went until he died. This what you know, it's just a temporary thing. Which is hard for us to think. We don't worry about so much about the things. Right now, there's a lot going on in this world. There's a lot going on in this nation, in this state. And we have things we can do about it. We can stand up for our rights. We are American citizens. But we're not going to worry about what happens because it's going to fade away. I'm a proud United States citizen. But I know the United States will one day fall. Because it was a system created by a fallen people. This world will fade away for a new heaven, a new earth is coming. And so we don't worry as much about these things on earth that we have some control over and very little control over. You can't control whether you catch the coronavirus or not. You can help limit that by doing things. They're saying the mask help, not getting into theological or 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 political debate with you. They say the mask help. They say social distancing help. They say things, you could take steps to, to, to help with that. But if you're going to catch coronavirus, you're going to catch coronavirus. That doesn't mean you should just be like whatever. But it means you don't worry. Be safe, but don't worry. We have peace. You have peace when you are dealing with death. And I know some of you in this room are dealing with death. Someone in your life has just passed away. And you mourn. Rightfully so. Jesus wept. So you mourn. But because we know that eternal life is real, we have hope for the future. Some of you are dealing with death in a very real way that you're facing death. And I mean, some of we're all facing death at some point in life. We're never promised tomorrow. But some of you are facing death in a very real way. Cancer. Sicknesses. People online, some of you have COVID. Which is taking people's lives. But we face death with the peace that if God wants us here, he'll keep us here. And if God wants us to leave, then it's time for us to leave. We have peace. And with that peace comes the strength to do what God's called us to do. How many of you know God's called you to do something? Amen. If you're not dead yet, Amen. some of you are still walking zombies. <laughs> if you're not dead yet, God has called you to do something. Now, it may have changed from when you were 19, but he still called you to do something now. And with that, that hope of eternal life, we know that we have the peace, we have the strength, we have the glory of God, we can do what He needs us to do. And so we take with our next steps. Our next steps, the first thing has got to be as we ask this question is, is, have you accepted Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? This has to be the first question. Have you accepted Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? If you are not, you are walking the path that leads to hell. We're not just talking about a nice rock song that you can really get down to. We're talking about a path that leads to eternal separation from Christ, the eternal destruction.
have you accepted his eternal life? If the answer is no, then obviously the obvious answer is you must accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We, we know that the Bible tells us that if we, we admit we need him, we believe in him with our hearts, our head, our very, the word is our very being. We don't have a good English word for this. Our very, it's more than just your head, it's more than just your heart, it's more than just your gut, it's more than just your soul, it's with everything that makes you you. When we believe in that, and we confess Him with our mouth, we will be saved. And if the answer is yes, then the next we must respond is, well, one, are we dealing with death? Have you come to grips with the fact that you are going to die one day? And are you living life in agreement that you have eternal life now? Sometimes we say that, but it's easy for us to say that just like Thomas, right? It's easy to say, well, let's go die with him. But when it comes to actually dying, he ain't there. When when the rubber hits the road, are we following, we're actually living our life like we have eternal life? Father God, I praise you today, Lord. Lord, I ask that if there's someone in this room that does not know you, that you will, Holy Spirit, just move in their lives and convict them. Show them the path that they are on leads to destruction. And that your path leads to righteousness and and eternal life. As you describe as paradise. Lord, I pray that Someone in this room who's dealing with death in a very real way, they've lost someone. That you will comfort them with your shalom peace, that you will comfort them. As we know that you even mourn, that that they are mourning. Lord, as they mourn, let it be for your glory that that, that as they mourn, it will draw them closer to you. For the gift of death. As we await that resurrection life and for those that person in the room that's dealing with death on a, on a very real that they are dying Lord if it be their will heal that body but Lord if it not help give them the peace that they will live on in your life as we deal with death as your gift as it leads to that everlasting life in your glory with a new body and a new earth and a new heaven. And we praise you for that. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to enter a time of uh, invitation.